Today I'll be talking about Sensor Hub for smartphones and tablets. And then we'll look at uh, some of the key sensor features to look for and integration issues to consider. Phone manufacturers are faced with this problem of uh, being able to stand out. They have the chipsets from semiconductor companies. The same chipsets are accessible to all. The same software, Android typically, is accessible to all. And they really want to add product differentiation. And this hopefully will be uh, a step towards that. So phone manufacturers need something unique and features that stand out, features that are not power hungry. I and mean, if you recommend features that really kill the battery, that's really not good. And if that feature could lead to new services and revenues for the service provider, that would be even better. So activity detection, uh, the importance of activity de detection. And that's the problem we're really trying to solve here. So if you, take a, if you have phones, and if you had a way of being able to detect uh, activity, that is whether a person is walking, running, running faster, driving, these kind of things. This adds one more dimension of information about the user. The service providers already have information about who the subscriber is. They know roughly where he's located, GPS, they would know that. Uh, assuming the customer enables the data to be made, to be made available. Then this adds one more dimension, activity. For example, uh, and then with this data, you could do data analytics on the cloud, and you can enable cloud-based services, so which could lead to additional revenue streams. That is, for example, you could do some, uh, you, you'll be, you would be able to present uh, discount coupons. Uh, if you find out that you're taking your family shopping, you're out of your area, but in a shopping area, you're walking, it's evening time. You're not sitting in a conference room taking uh, in a meeting. So that's when you would want to uh, present some discount coupons. And in addition, you could do activity detection for driving safety. So if you're able to detect that a person is driving, uh, you could disable uh, some texting, for example. So GPS, I put it in dotted circle because that can add a lot of value. Uh, you need some kind of AGPS or GPS, uh, and that would be beneficial. So activity detection requires low power expertise. So if you think of, of what is required, activity detection, ha uh, activity detection has to keep running in the background for a long time. So you cannot have this be driven by an application. It has to be on all the time. So what are the typical devices that have been all the time, on all the time and running for a long time? So these are like uh, devices like watches, calculators, very low power, very low voltage uh, devices, security tokens. They run forever. Uh, some of them claim 10 years on a single coin cell battery. So if you can take that expertise and apply it to phones, that's a different approach to solving Sensor Hub, uh, adding a dimension to that. So Sensor Hub for smartphones, uh, this is typically, uh, this picture is just showing uh, where the Sensor Hub sits. Uh, you'd, you see the host CPU in the middle, uh, and then the Sensor Hub, all the sensors hanging off of the Sensor Hub. Uh, no, nothing really special. Uh, this also shows uh, what is done with each of these uh, sensors. For example, accelerometer, read, calibration, uh, motion detection, and so on. But there are some exotic sensors which are mentioned here. Uh, not, not all of these would be realistic, uh, X-ray sensor and all that, but they're here anyway. Uh, the point is uh, uh, Rome and Oki together, uh, the v, uh, Lapis Semiconductor, uh, we have the ability to uh, the, uh, to, to sense the spectrum uh, fully, right from X-ray gamma rays to infrared. So two ways of using the sensor of microcontroller. Uh, one would be inside the phone. So that would be, uh, this would enable uh, chipset vendors, for example, to provide a reference design to some customers, or phone customers to provide a, a special model of phone. Uh, and the other way is to provide it, uh, use the sensor of outside uh, as a sports band, you, something you wear on your arm, and that talks to your phone. So a sports accessory. So that could be another uh, use case. A Bluetooth LE interface would be required uh, to talk to the phone in that case. So th this picture is uh, showing the sensor hub uh, low, low power microcontroller. What you can see on the left side, uh, it's showing that power consumption would be high if you're running. Uh, now phones using sensor hub can significantly reduce power consumption when the application continuously requires sensors. So that's what you need for activity detection. 
So if your uh, app's processor is continuously accessing any of the MEM sensors, your power consumption would be very high. And if, if you, of course, use a, a sensor hub, uh, only power on only the sensor hub, the current consumed uh, during uh, to access the sensor is the same, but the average power has totally come down. Uh, this is one. Uh, this is one implementation. This is the Lapis Semiconductor ML610Q792. Uh, this is a sensor hub, 8-bit. Uh, it's based on a U8 8-bit core. Uh, what's what's what different about this from a standard microcontroller is it has dual I squared C SPI interfaces. On one end, it can talk to uh, all the sensors. Other side, it can talk to the host processor. Uh, it also has. Uh, 16-bit uh, uh, multiply divide uh, Mac, and uh, that's a hardware accelerator available. It also has data logging RAM, so it can work independently of the app's processor and keep logging uh, all the memory uh, data up to 8 kilobytes, and then uh, send it out to the host CPU without even this CPU's intervention. So it's like state machine driven. So th there are a couple of neat things, and then the interrupt controller. Uh, since you are using, going to be using many sensors with it, uh, this chip has optimal. Uh, it has several interrupt sources, uh, much more than any standard microcontroller would have. And uh, another key thing to observe is it's it's 8-bit, uh, running on 4 megahertz, running at 4 megahertz, and uh, consuming about 900 microamps uh, while running, fully functioning. So in stock mode, it is 0.6 microamp, but I think the important one is less than one milliamp consumption while running. Uh, this was a case study we did. Uh, a phone, we took a phone, and uh, it was using, as you can see, a Hummingbird processor, Cortex-A8, running at one gigahertz, dual core, I believe. And the, uh, if you ran an application that was consuming 41 milliamps, this was for the pedometer application running on the processor, so th which can distinguish all the states. The same app, if you run it on the sensor hub microcontroller, and now the phone, uh, the power consumption came down to 1.6 milliamps. So th that's that's the problem we're trying to solve. And identical conditions, display off, Wi-Fi off, and so on. You can see that. Uh, the sensor hub uh, processor also comes with the SDK, a software development kit, and you see three pieces to this. Uh, one of these is the sensor drivers, the sensor spe specific drivers. Those are in the brown color. Uh, we provide the source code for that. The source code allows you to uh, change the drivers, so you can change your sensors. And the other part is the sensor application and the host interface. So that source code is also made available, so you can make it talk to any host processor and change, tweak the application if you want. Uh, the only part which is in a library form is the uh, algorithm for the pedometer and the state detection. Then uh, the rest, uh, other software which is available is uh, on the Android or uh, uh, the OS dependent area, the application. So sensor fusion scenario. So now we have heard a lot about sensor fusion and uh, just wanted to see, well, the question was 8-bit microprocessor uh, and sensor fusion, how, how is an 8-bit hub uh, going to do? So let's just examine the sensor fusion scenarios. So examples of requiring, uh, applications requiring sensor fusion are inclinometer, uh, steering wheel uh, operation, device orientation for, particularly for augmented reality control, first person style games, and so on, pointing applications. So these are what really requires sensor fusion. And, and that, if you try to implement on a 32-bit microcontroller, it typically takes about 20 MIPS and a 32-bit processor to be able to do that, give and take, whatever. So the important thing to realize is the application's processor is awake at the time. So because that app's processor is awake, uh, you, could, you could use that. So it might, you have to do the trade-off between using the app's processor, consuming a little more power during the, when the phone is on versus activity detection forever when the phone is off. That's the comparison. Sensor fusion requires performance, while activity detection requires low power. And using a 32-bit sensor hub to do both would be suboptimal. Now, if you do the sensor hub, whether it physically sits in the apps, uh, in the main chipset, or whether it sits outside, makes no difference. The physical location is irrelevant. It's whether you want to use a 32-bit high-speed processor or whether you want to use a low-performance uh, low 
processor, low power processor for activity detection. So sensor hub for phones and tablets. So for phones, typically you need this was this was our take, and not everybody would agree. Low power hub for activity detection. Sensor fusion it could be done on the app's processor. And tablets, that's where gaming is important. Uh, you see people moving those things and playing virtual games. I don't see that, well, there would be to some extent on the phones, but you, hopefully you can do that on the app's processor. And it will also depend on the operating system, whether you can do that. So benefits of using an external sensor hub would be time to market. The software is provided, and it avoids work on low-level driver software on multi-core processors. So this is told since it's outside, you don't have to deal with a lot of the complexity. Power savings, uh, longer battery life between charges. Uh, so small CPU cores and multi-core chips are likely to consume more power than this 8-bit uh, controller. And product differentiation, that's an important one. If you put it inside the chipset, uh, again, it leads to the same thing. Everybody has the same thing. So it, it might ultimately happen, but right now, at least temporarily, the product differentiation benefit could be there. And it opens up opportunity to enable new revenue streams. So this is Sensor Hub and Sensor Fusion for tablets. Uh, this slide is basically from our sister company, Kionics. Uh, they, they do provide a, a hardware solution that on the roadmap uh, that's uh, a, a, a much more powerful Sensor Hub uh, for this, this would be for tablets. Now we're switching gear, we're going away from uh, phones to tablets. So this is a 32-bit Sensor Hub MCU. Uh, left side is the hardware implementation, and on the right side uh, you see the a software implementation, which is uh, without using the sensor of MCU. And this would be for tablets and gaming. So evolution of sensor hub for tablets. Uh, so tablets have larger power budgets than mobile handsets. And it's a little better. Uh, gaming is the driver, and performance is key. And we'll see both hardware 16, 32-bit MCUs and software implementations of sensor fusion, I think. And eventually, uh, the 16 32 bit MCUs will likely be absorbed by the chipset, or it could get absorbed by the uh, sensor itself, I mean, a, a single sensor with the 32 bit CPU. And I believe uh, the chipset might have an advantage because chipset vendors have uh, finite geometries. So um, any computation probably makes sense to do it. It would be cheaper to do it on the chipset. That's just an argument. Now, sensor fusion IP will be available from several suppliers. Uh, th that will definitely be true, and I think we are already seeing that happening. Now, away from sensor hub into general sensors for tablets and phones. This has got nothing to do with sensor hub now. Uh, so there, there are ambient light sensors. Uh, there are various types here, analog, digital. And I just wanted to highlight what would make a good ambient light sensor, proximity sensor. Uh, the other sensors which go with phones, Hall effect, temperature, MEMS accelerometers and gyroscopes, uh, touch sensors, resistive and capacitive, uh, infrared image sensors, and uh, IR photodiodes and uh, PIR sensor. And this is for longer range uh, human presence detection. Ultraviolet AB sensors. Uh, this could go into phones. This came out a few years ago, but never really picked up. Uh, but maybe it, it, it could take off any time. And I think there is a good way to make that happen. I'll share that with you. Sensor hub, uh, of course, we just spoke about that. Sensor hub. A sensor fusion solution that would come from Kionics. And optical image uh, stabilization system. So we have an OIS controller. So there is a lot of. Uh, uh, optics uh, expertise also within the group of companies. So if you see, the, uh, what you see here is, uh, I'll cover that later, a uh, lot of sensors and optics, analog mixed signal processing. So choosing an ambient light sensor, this, is, this should be nothing new. Uh, well, the key point here is if you have two channels of photodiodes, so one uh, which is more sensitive to visible light, one more sensitive to infrared light, uh, that enables you to uh, provide output which is independent of the illumination source. So you can tweak, and we'll get into a little bit of detail uh, how that is done. 
Uh, other things, just small form factor, wide operating range. Uh, I think I have a slide, a slide on that, yeah. So good low light sensitivity, dynamic range, adjustable gain, measurement of visible light in IR. Uh, <coughs> And uh, yeah, so that uh, uh, gets rid of the source dependency. So I squared C, interrupt output with high and low thresholds. So you, you want to interrupt function on that. Power down, 50 hertz, 60 hertz noise rejection, 1.8 volt logic interface. These are all standard features. The important one is at the bottom. That is true lux calculations with varying optical window characteristics. So that, that would, that's a service we help uh, our consumers with. Our customers with sorry, and device driver and documentation of course. So th this slide just shows that uh, with fluorescent lamp, uh, the the spectral output is very different from the spectral output of an incandescent lamp. And what happens is if you do a lux measurement, if your sensor is tuned to one of these sensitive to one of these frequencies, it, it picks up the wrong lux value. So th this slide is showing uh, the. Uh, Incandescent to fluorescent sensitivity ratio. So on the left side, you see true lux readings, uh, all of them uh, close to 1.0, which means irrespective of the light source, the lux reading has been tuned. It's now you're going to get a constant value. On the right side, a low cost ALS, a single channel photodiode, the, this would be the response you get. The lux readings would change a lot. So this is one of the services the, that Rome also provides, which is the optical window glass-related calculations. This is very important. If you can find out the uh, color of the glass, the size of the optical window, reflectivity, several parameters. Uh, you can do all the modeling, and, and we can provide the equation like this. So since we have two channels, that is the data 0 and data 1, uh, we can play around with the coefficients uh, that you apply to the equation to get your lux values. And with that, uh, we, uh, Rome actually helps you determine the uh, coefficients for your optical uh, glass and the optical window. And then you get a very constant lux value throughout. And this was the new ambient light sensor plus UV sensor kind of concept. So we heard about two diodes, and it's possible to put in a third UV uh, sensor there. And what with that you will also you'll, you can get uh, true lux measurements taken to the next level, and also UV sensing could be added to phones, at very small incremental cost. Selecting a proximity plus ambient light sensor, yeah, this is now switching to proximity sensor. Proximity sensor is nothing but the ambient light sensor at the bottom. This is a combo device. On top there is a infrared LED driver and a receiver. So with that, you can uh, read the proximity. Uh, what were uh, the key things to observe is uh, your dual photodiodes for the ALS. That gives you better tunability. We already saw that. Then there is a linear to log converter block on the IR LED sensor path. And what that does is the sensor output typically varies on the right side uh, is, is what uh, uh, your sensor output would be, proximity sensor output. And if you have a linear to log converter, you get a more linear output. And with that, you could use a lower cost A to D converter. Uh, uh, you don't need a 16-bit uh, EDC. So it will reduce the cost of your proximity sen uh, sensor. Then there are Hall effect ICs. Uh, the typical applications are open, closed lid detection, typically for tablets. You can use that. In addition, for phones, uh, the on-off button, uh, the big button which you operate all the time, uh, you could put a Hall effect sensor there. Uh, then the bipolar latch hall IC on the right side, you see all these applications where you, you turn a dial. And this could be a useful form of UI, a new form of UI for e-readers. You know, currently we have a lot of these e-readers with either buttons or you swipe, you take your hand and put it on the screen. It might be just convenient to scroll through pages uh, with a wheel, like a thumb wheel switch. You know. That that could be. It's very cheap to do this, and it's reliable, non-mechanical contact. This is another thing to consider. So expertise, support, and uh, ecosystem. Actually, John uh, spoke uh, about Kionix yesterday. I, I took the same slide, modified it slightly. So. Uh, Sensors expertise, that's what the group offers. Analog, mixed signal, microcontrollers, MEMS, and optical systems. 
And when you pick a vendor or choose, uh, of course, you technical support, application support are required. But modeling and simulation are equally important, particularly optical and magnetic model modeling, those capabilities. And of course, you need all the other things, local regional support, special request fulfillment, integration services. Then the ecosystem, uh, we need to have the right partners uh, and uh, driver availability, fusion implementations. We're looking for flexibility throughout. The summary, sensor hub for mobile handsets and tablets have different requirements. Uh, this is what we believe. If you want to do activity detection uh, on mobile handsets, a low power uh, sensor hub would be very beneficial. And that would enable uh, activity detection for driver safety and activity detection for new cloud-based services. Sensor hub for tablets, on the other hand, it's for gaming, sensor fusion, and you could, you could do all that on that. Hope you work, choose to work with sensor spe specialists. Thank you. I appreciate it.